عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام. وعليكم السلام. ما شاء الله. Interesting. We're gathered here on Christmas Eve, talking about Isa عليه السلام. You know, when the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم when he entered into Medina to Munawwara, he noticed that the Jews were fasting on Yom Ashura. And he asked them why they were doing that, and they told him that this is to commemorate our master Musa alayhi <clears throat> salam, uh, the Prophet Mo Moses, peace be upon him, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the Bani Israel from the Fir'aun. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he said, we have a greater right upon Musa alayhi salam. We as an ummah, the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, have a greater right over Musa alayhi salam. So he also fasted on Yomi Ashura, but also to differentiate his ummah from Bani Israel, also to fast before or after. It's a sunnah fast. And I would say also that, and I think, and I'm not a scholar, but all, all scholars would agree with me that, that we have a greater right to Isa alayhi salam mm. uh, as well. As Christians are gathering tonight in various churches around the world and the next day, uh, worshiping Isa alayhi salam as God, right? What does the Quran say? It's very interesting. How ironic the first words of Isa alayhi salam in the Quran on the day of his mawlid, right? So we're told, فَأَتَتْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُوا قَالُوا يَا مَرْيَمُ وَلَقَدْ جِئَتِ شَيْئًا فَرِيَا So we're told that Maryam alayhi salam, she brought the newborn Isa alayhi salam within the sight of her family. And then her family says, Oh Maryam, this is a strange thing that you have. A strange thing that has happened or that you've brought. Right? So they're, you know, insinuating something uh, about her. You know, um, you can imagine if... You know, if you have a, uh, if you know a woman who's saintly in your eyes, never done anything wrong, and she says to you, I heard voices and I was impregnated uh, miraculously and I'm holding a baby, it would be very, very difficult for you to believe her, right? So something has to happen here, something out of the ordinary, right? Um, what we call Khawarikul uh, Adat, breaks of natural law or breaches of, of physics, as we know physics. So, فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِ So, they, uh, so فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِ She pointed to the baby. قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ صَبِيَّةً How can we talk to, one, to talk to someone who is a child in the cradle, a newborn infant? And we're told in the Qur'an, that miraculously, this is a mu'jiza, that Isa alayhi salam, he spoke, قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ آتَانِيَ الْكِتَابَ وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيَّا وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُ وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيَّا So Isa alayhi salam, he says, Indeed, I am the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has given me revelation and has made me a prophet and has made me blessed wherever I am. So these are the first words of Isa alayhi salam, according to the uh, Qur'an. And we're told in the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the Yawm al-Qiyamah, He will ask Isa alayhi salam in front of the whole of humanity, Ya Isa ibn Maryam, anta qulta lil nas, ittakhidhuni, wa ummiya ilahini min duni Allah. So, O oh Jesus, the son of Mary, uh, did you ever say to the people, uh, to take you as a divine being or your mother as a divine being, right? Other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the immediate response, and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the, knows the answer to the question, right? This is to establish, uh, so Imam Suyuti, he says, this is out of tawbikh, out of censuring the Nasara, right? Not his ummah, because the Christians are not the ummah, of Isa alayhi salam, he is in our ummah, right? Isa alayhi salam is a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. He is a Sahabi by definition, hmm. right? What is a Sahabi? So a Sahabi is someone who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam laid his blessed eyes on this person because they were blind Sahaba, right? While they were both alive, so you might have a dream in which you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and he's looking at you, right? 
Um, and that's a true dream, because shaitan cannot imitate uh, the Prophet sallallahu but this is during his life, right? His life in the dunya. He has a different life now, it's called Hayat Barzakhiyah. So he's alive, but in a different sense, right? And then uh, this person, whom the Prophet sallallahu looked at, or gazed upon, uh, believed in him at that moment. So we know that Isa alayhi uh, did not die, right? This is a major point of contention we have with Christians. Um, but the Quran states it as a matter of fact. The Quran, we believe the Quran, the author of the Quran is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has direct access to history. And he's simply telling us that this did not happen. Something, something happened, right? And we have ulama that uh, theorize what could have happened. There's nothing definitive from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Something happened. It was made to appear so that Isa alayhi wa was crucified. But he was not killed or crucified. Right? But it was made to appear so unto them. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he, he is a Sahabi in our ummah, Isa alayhi salam. Right? And we believe in the second coming of Isa alayhi salam. This is something that is stated in multiple hadith. Um, over 20, 25 Sahaba relate this. So the response of Isa alayhi salam on the Yom al-Qiyamah, his initial response is, Subhanak. Right? Uh, which is to say, glory be to thee. And Imam al-Haddad, he mentions, and others mention, Imam al-Razi mentions that just the question itself uh, was, is very difficult, is going to be very difficult for Isa alayhi salam to even process, to even hear. So he's going to start sort of writhing and shaking. So he says, Subhanak, ma, uh, ma yakunu li an akula ma laysa li bihaq. In, kun, in kuntu qulhu faqad alimta ta'alamu ma fi nafsi wa la a'lamu ma fi nafsik innaka anta alimul ghuyub. So he says, glory be to you. It was never for me to say anything that you did not command me. I only said what you commanded me to say. Right? And you are the, the knower of everything that is unseen. I only said to them what you commanded me to say. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is my Lord and your Lord. Right? So, the theology of Isa is, uh, is renewed in a sense by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, uh, he revived the true teachings of the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he is a universal messenger. So Isa alayhi salam, we have to also understand this contextually, he's dealing with a certain mentality at his time, right? So some of his teachings uh, are not universal um, in some aspects, right? So I remember, because it was uh, maybe 20 years ago, me and Abdul Rashid here, Sidi Abdul Rashid. Uh, this was after 9-11, right? So there was a lot of sort of interest in Islam. And, and so, um, and so uh, we would literally drive around and go to churches, right? Just knock on the door. And sometimes they let us in. Sometimes, I mean, we look like we're friendly guys, right? <laughs> let us in the door and um, we talk to the pastor and we get different responses, but I remember this one pastor, I don't know if you remember, Fremont Community Church, he's, he looked at us and we sort of said, we want to have a dialogue with you on the status of Isa and Salaam, and just, you know, sort of teach your congregation <laughs> about Islam. And, and he said, yeah, well, um, you know, you know what the word pastor means? And I said, yeah, it means a shepherd. He said, that's very good. It does mean shepherd. So I'm a shepherd and I have to protect my flock from the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, at least you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I remember one night I was watching TV and there was this uh, story and it said that so there was this uh, Iranian Christian pastor apparently an apostate from Islam who was going to give a <laughs> he's going to give a lecture at a church the next day on Sunday and the sermon was called why I'm not a Muslim maybe I told the story before if you've heard it it's okay um, I could ask my wife I repeat a lot of things um, it's okay. Uh, so anyway, why I'm not a Muslim? So I said, oh, that's interesting. So uh, I called this brother here, and we said, let's, let's, let's go to this. Let's go to the sermon that he's going to give. He said, okay. 
And there was maybe like five or six of us, actually. Right? I think Abdul was there. A few other brothers were there. So we go to this church, and I remember we walked in, and the pastor, I'm not going to say his name, because, um, anyway, a different issue. But anyway, he was, he was there, and I remember he looked up at us, and he, and he just, he was, <laughs> his face went blank. Like, what are these guys doing here? So you could tell he kind of, you know, kind of changed things up on the fly a little bit, you know, kind of did some quick edits, right? <laughs> he was very uncomfortable. He was sweating through his suit. But we were there, we were smiling. And so anyway, I said to him after, I said, uh, do you want to do like a debate? Um, I think it'd be interesting because you're, you know, former Muslim and, you know, I'm Muslim and uh, maybe we can have like a debate and let people know what happened and let people judge. And, you know, the Quran tells us to engage in jidal. Right? To engage in debate with Ahl al Kitab, with, with, uh, with, um, with hikmah, with wisdom, which the ulama say means here, with academic rigor, sophistication, and and with beautiful exhortation or preaching, or they say here with good character, right? This is the Sunnah way of making da'wah, uh, right? is to have a good uh, uh, logos, as Aristotle would say, good logic, right, to have to be intelligent, to use reason, but also good ethos or ethos, which means to have good character, khuluk husun, khuluk hasan. So, so he said, uh, yeah, let's, let's discuss that. So, okay, so we, I, I didn't think I'd ever hear from him again. I mean, I hear this all the time, but lo and behold, you know, he called me and he said, let's meet at this restaurant and we can talk about the debate and the parameters and whatnot. I said, great. Uh, so we go there and um, so i never forget, he, he looked at me, you know, this Christian pastor, former Muslim, apparently, and he said, and he started speaking Farsi to me, to, you know, to get on my, even though I don't speak Farsi very well. But he said, Ali John, first and foremost, I'm a businessman. <laughs> okay. He said, we can make a lot of money doing this. Oh, or I, I guess. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm clueless, right? I'm just like, I'm not hip to the game, apparently. I'm uninitiated. And he said, and I said, so he said, what topics are you thinking about? I gave all these, oh, slow it off, slow it off. We, we could do this topic this day. You'll say this, I'll say this. We'll go back and forth. We won't reveal too much. And then the se second debate, you know, we'll get more people, we'll charge prices, and this and that. Hmm. So, oh, okay. And then he kind of looked at me and he said, you know, sometimes I still recite the Quran. I said, oh, okay. And then suddenly it clicked in my mind. I said to him, are you Muslim? <laughs> and then he went like this. <laughs> I said, subhanAllah, wow. He said, this is a very good job, is what he said. He said, I, and he had like a, a Hummer outside, you know, and he lives in like Ruby Hills or something like that, wearing an Armani suit. You know, the prosperity gospel. This is a very common uh, version, perversion, I should say, of the message of Isa, even as it exists in the New Testament. This idea, and people, you know, Christians in this country, this is happening, this is really an American phenomenon. They fill up baseball stadiums, basketball stadiums, the Staples Center is filled up on Sunday, listening to the prosperity gospel. This idea that uh, if, how do you know God loves you? He gives you money. That's basically what it comes down to. The more money you have, the more God loves you. Right? It's very interesting, you know, because you, if you read the New Testament, <laughs> What does Isa a.s. say in the New Testament? Of course, there's no senad for these things, right? So this is just sort of, they're basically very, very weak hadith. Many of them are moldur. But just for the sake of argument, you know, because this is their hujjah. This is, this is a text that they believe is sound. You know, Isa a.s. says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter paradise, right? And some of the ulama say this, you know, the needle mean there was a you know cities were gated and, the, and the, there was a little door called the needle and you have to push the camel through. The, this is a this is much later. So Aquinas mentions this and he attributes it to Ambrose from the 11th century. 
So this is very late sort of interpretation. But if you look at earlier, like Jewish, like the Talmud, things like that, much closer to Isa, Isa they said that they, they always use this expression. Sometimes an elephant through a needle, a, a donkey through a needle, a camel through a needle. So this is very literal. This is what he means, quite literally. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter paradise. Meaning it's impossible for a rich man to enter paradise. And interestingly enough, the analogy or the parable is in the Quran, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا وَاسْتَقْبَرُوا عَنْهَا لَا تُفَتَّحُ لَهُمْ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ وَلَا يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ حَتَّى يَلِجَ الْجَمَلُ فِي السَّمِّ الْخِيَاطِ Those who belie our signs and are arrogant towards them, these, the heavens will not be opened for them, nor will they enter paradise until the camel can pass through the eye of a needle. Right? So what does this mean? I mean, it means, and... We take it literally, it has two meanings, that a rich man has to give everything away before he dies or else he's in trouble, according to the teachings of Isa a.s. Or it could mean that the rich man cannot let even one dinar into his heart. That if he were to lose everything, it would make no difference to him because everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the essence of the teaching of Isa a.s. This is something that the Christians just, they got some things right, but the major things they got wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, In the Quran, he says about the Nasara, he says, we made a covenant with them, but they disregarded a portion of what we gave to them. This is the true essence, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whose, whose sunnah is more universal, right? He said, There's nothing wrong with the rich man as long as he has taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his heart. But then he said, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ أُمَّتِي إِنَّ لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ فِتْنَةٍ وَفِتْنَةٍ تُو أُمَّتِي الْمَالِ Right? He said, every ummah has a fitna, has a trial or tribulation. And the tribulation of my ummah is wealth. Right? That wealth prevents one from the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One starts to think of himself as independent, mustaghnin, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghani. Everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely independent. This is the teaching of Isa alayhi salam. In our tradition, we have hadith of Isa alayhi salam in our tradition. Some of them are strong, some of them are weak, but they're in our tradition. They're not in the New Testament. Some of them have parallels in the New Testament, right? Like what I was mentioning earlier about on the Yom al-Qiyamah, there's something similar to this in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, and we don't want to get too much into the sort of source criticism of the New Testament, but many scholars believe that this, this section in the New Testament actually comes from a much earlier source that predates Paul, because much of the Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, have been sort of um, inspired, or, or I should say, uh, they've been sort of um, uh, tainted with Pauline theology because Paul was the first writer of the New Testament. The Gospels came about 20, 30, 40 years later. But in this section of Matthew 7, it comes from an independent source that Matthew had access to that's probably pre-Pauline. But anyway, scholars call it special M or Mathean material. But anyway, Jesus says, according to this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, he says, not everyone who says to be kurie, kurie, which means rabbi, rabbi, right? And Christians, they translate this as Lord, Lord, capital L. Right? Kurie, what? no, Rabbi, Rabbi means Rabbi, right? Rabbi, you ever thought about that? That's what it is. So when, when, a, when a Jewish guy says to his Rabbi, Rabbi, is he calling him God? Of course not. They're completely ignoring the context. So the Greek, it's in Greek though. Kurie, Rabbi, Rabbi. Not everyone who says to be Rabbi, Rabbi should enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of God. On that day, many will come to me and say, Kurie, Kurie, Master, Master, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and in your name perform many miracles? Right? This is in Matthew 7, chapter 21 to 23. So who is Isa alayhi salam, according to this source, which is very close to his life? Again, it's very, very weak. It's in the wrong language, but it's pre-Pauline, and that's very important. If you know anything about New Testament studies, that's very, very important. Who is he talking to? Is he talking to... Who? Is he, is he talking to Jews? Is he talking to Christians? Is he talking to Hindus? So he's talking to 
it looks like Jews that kind of did things in his name, kind of deified him, right? Uh, who does these things in the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus, you know? Uh, exorcisms, in the name of Jesus. So he's clearly talking about Christians, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, he's talking to Christians. What is his response? Right? So in the Quran, his response is Subhanak, glory be to you. And then he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the Quran, in uh, If you punish them, they're your slaves. Subhanallah. But if you forgive them, then you are the great and wise. Now a prophet would never ask something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is impossible because that is bad adab. Like Musa alayhi salam, what is anvur ilayk? He said to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reveal yourself to me so that I might gaze upon you. Lan tarani, you will not see me. And Imam Suwiti says that Allah did not say, lan ura, I cannot be seen. He said, you will not see me. Right? So there's a possibility, it's mumkin that in the Quran says this in, in different ayat, that we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ila kayfiyya on the yawm al qiyamah and in Jannah, the people of Jannah will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with any, without any type of modality. There's no how to it, right? It's an utter mystery. It's called the beatific vision. So here, in, in, in essence, Isa alayhi salam in the Quran is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if people considered me to be some sort of divine being, but they did it out of ignorance, they were misinformed, if you forgive them, right? Making dua for people. And this is part of our theology. Right? And this is orthodox, normative, Sunni theology. This is not Berkeley theology, right? surfer theology. Is that if Imam Ghazali says, Imam Ghazali, the champion of orthodoxy, the mujaddid of his time, recognized the world over. You know, he says, if someone is not aql or balig, he doesn't have salamatul hawas, there's no taklif established on a person. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not put someone into hell who did not, who was not reached with a sound prophetic summons. Right? The message of tawheed in a good form must have reached this person, and this person, understanding that message, rejected it. Like, for example, Abu Jahal. Right? Some people say, oh, Abu Jahal, he, he was also a very gifted poet. Al-Walid ibn Mughira. Sayyid Abdul Rashid, he mentioned Al-Walid ibn Mughira incredible poet. Why didn't he become Muslim? He doesn't, he doesn't recognize the, the, the Quran is a sui generis, it's a one-of-a-kind literary masterpiece. Of course he does. It's because the Quran is calling to a certain way of life. Hmm. Right? It's calling to a certain morality, a certain sort of theology. This is difficult for people. Right? Um, so anyway, uh, in the Bible, in Matthew, going back to Matthew 7, what is the response of Isa a. In the Greek, he says, he says, uh, he says, uh, he says, uh, he says, uh, pate he says in the Greek is very, very strong. It's very difficult to translate. But basically, he says, never did I know you. And then he says, like this, like, get away from me. And then he says, uh, he says, um, you workers, hoi ergazamanoi tein anomian. Very interesting wording, right? So usually this is translated as, you workers of iniquity. Get away from me, you workers of iniquity. But the actual Greek says, anomian, a nomos. You rejectors of sharia. Because nomos, what does nomos mean? Nomos means law in, in Greek. Nomos, right? Like an antinomian. Pauline Christianity is antinomian. They reject the Sharia except for a few of the commandments. So I say Christians are eating pork, right? They're eating it like it's water. <laughs> you know? Why are you eating pork? Leviticus says don't eat pork. So no, no, no. There's a new, there's a new covenant. The new Covenant, Blood Covenant, New Testament. So what about Isa? Did he ever eat pork? No. Oh, strange. 
Are you followers of Isa alayhi salam or who, who are you following? Who is your real Lord? Paul. <laughs> That's what it is. It's Paul. Yeah, Pauline Christianity. Right? Which is very, very interesting. So, you know, the, the Torah in the Quran says, quoting Isa alayhi salam, Musaddiqa lima bayna yaday min Torah. I confirm the Torah. But then he says, I also make certain things halal that were haram, quoting Isa alayhi salam. In other words, and that's the affair of the Rasul, he's a Rasul. He can make amendments and addendums to the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam because he has the maqam of a Rasul, right? So there's certain things he did make adjustments. So, so basically Isa alayhi salam is confirming theology. Theology never changes. Theology is never open to naskh or abrogation. Aqidah never changes. Our aqidah is exactly the aqidah of Adam alayhi salam. Nothing changes in aqidah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is immutable. But sharia can change according to the circumstances. But major principles of the sharia, like maqasid and things like that, those things don't change. But the fundamentals of the sharia. Right? So in the Torah it says, Lo ish el vi chazev, Numbers 23, 19, which means God is not a man that he should lie, right? And at the college, I have my students memorize this verse in Hebrew. It's not that long. Lo ish e v'chazev. God is not a man that he should lie. Do you have it? Did I, did I have you guys memorize? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe I skipped a couple. God is not a man. So what does this mean? God is not a man that he should lie. It's a very strange, again, it's, a lot of these translations are very cryptic, and it's hard to know what's happening here. And the Quran actually says this. The Quran says that there's a section from the people of the book, bilkitabi. They twist their, it literally says, they twist their tongues around the book. Right? Twist their tongues around the book. What does that mean? Well, Al-Sina means the literal physical tongue. But in Quranic Arabic, it's also the word for language. Lisan means language in the Quran. The Quran doesn't use the word loha. Loha is probably from Greek, logos. Right? It's a loan word from Greek, probably. Lisan is the Semitic word, and it means language. In other words, they're messing with translations. Right? The people of the book, they mess around these translations. Um, so what does, this word, what does this verse mean? It means, whoever claims to be God is a liar. That's what it means. It's very clear. Whoever claims to be God is a liar. Right? What else does the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament in Torah, teach? It says, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. This is Deuteronomy 24-17. And other places as well. Ezekiel chapter 18, the entire chapter, a very sustained argument against inheriting sin. Nobody inherits your sin. You might inherit the circumstances of your parents' sin, the circumstances, but not the sin itself. You're free from that sin. For example, if your father shoots someone, a'udhu billah, and goes to prison, and your mother can't afford to take care of the kids and has to move into a really small apartment and while she's pregnant with you, and then you're born in this small apartment, you've inherited the sins of your father, the circumstances of his sin, but not his literal sin. You didn't commit murder. That's not on your on your scroll, on the Yom al Qiyamah, right? So this is the theology of the Old Testament. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, peace be upon him, apparently says, you ever heard of the prodigal son parable? Uh, you ever heard of that? The, the prodigal son. The prodigal son returns, right? Probably heard this somewhere. This comes from Luke chapter 15. So what is this? So Jesus gives a parable. He says there, there's a man who has two sons. One of them stays with him. The other one goes out, and he's a musrif, like he's a spendthrift, and he's excessive, and he's a hedonist. He's, he wastes all his money, and he ends up sleeping a pig pen. Right? And then, so eventually he says, I need to go home and apologize to my father. So he starts walking back towards his home, and the father is sitting with his good son. They're just sitting and they're chatting. And then suddenly he sees his prodigal son returning and he completely ignores his good son, and he sees his son from afar, and they run towards each other, and they fall on each other's necks, as it says. That means they're, they're hugging, and they're crying, right? And that's the end of the parable. 
What is, it, what is he teaching? What is the ibra of this parable, of this method in the Gospel of Luke? Is he teaching a blood covenant by vicarious atonement? <laughs> did, did the father slaughter his son when he saw him suddenly? Oh, you're back. Slaughters him. This is for your sin. No. What is he teaching? He's teaching Toba. This is the entire moral, the ibra, the lesson of this parable is Toba. And Toba is a very important theological virtue, again, at the heart of the true Injil of Isa alayhi salam. Um, so every man is put to death for his own sin. And then it also says, whoever is hanged on a tree is accursed by God. It's also in Deuteronomy. Whoever is hanged on a tree, what does hanged on a tree mean? Again, it's like, uh, what is, you know, what, 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 are they, what are they talking about? They're talking about crucifixion. Right? Whoever is crucified is accursed by God. And what else does it say? Leviticus 3.17, You shall not drink blood, an everlasting statute, throughout all your generations. Right? Everlasting statute. So there are certain things in Jewish law, like I said, fundamental principles, or certain ceremonial laws that are never abrogated. They're never open to nusk. One of them is drinking blood, right? Because it's a pagan practice, right? Um, so, what do Christians believe then? They believe God became a man, right? Uh, who died for your sins. That's breach number two. Uh, how did he die? He's hanged on a tree. And how do they commemorate this event? They drink his blood, right? And this is literal in the Catholic Church. Literal, they believe, you know, I don't know if they're gonna do that. Usually you have the Christmas mass live from the Vatican. They're probably it's gonna start in a few hours. Very strange, but <clears throat> they believe that they have the wine and the Holy Spirit comes and magically transforms the essence of the wine into the literal blood of Jesus. Literal blood. The accidents remain, right? So the, it looks like wine, smells like wine, tastes like wine. But the essence has changed. The essence. Right? So we can see now how the Quran uh, is correct in its Christology. Right? That, that Isa alayhi salam, that these cannot be the teachings of Isa alayhi salam. If Isa alayhi salam as a rabbi claimed to be God in the first century, why would he expect any Jew to believe his claim? The Old Testament says, whoever commits blasphemy has to be stoned. And if you ask Christians, uh, why did the Jews in John chapter 8 pick up stones to stone Jesus? Christians will say he committed blasphemy. He claimed to be God. And then if you keep reading that section, he says to the Jews that picked up stones, you're children of Satan. So let me get this straight then. So Jesus, who is supposed to be healed to the Mani Israel at the time of Musa alayhi salam, whoever claims to be God has blasphemed and stoned them. And then he becomes a man uh, and blasphemes. And so the Jews are following what he had told them during the time of Musa alayhi salam. And then he calls them children of Satan. And then he expects them to believe his claim and go against what he had already said. There's, he's setting them up for failure. So the New Testament Jesus, the New Testament Jesus, hear the Christmas bells, oh no. The New, I take that as an exclamation to my point. The New Testament Jesus can, can, cannot be a true prophet. Cannot be a true prophet, right? Islam, the Quran, the Prophet them redeem Isa alayhi salam and give us the true teachings of our master Isa alayhi salam. Right? So this is this is a very important point to make. Right? Um, I'll, I'll stop here, but let's maybe have some questions and comments. And I'm going to open it up, inshallah. Questions, burning questions you've always had. It can be anything. Like, you know, whoa, what's a Mormon? Or, yes, yes, sir. Brother Joseph, mashallah. Uh, uh, when you refer to uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
And I'm, I'm always going to the office that they're referring to the writings of Paul. He said pre-Pauline when you're referring to uh, uh, some writing from uh, Matthew when you're doing a birthday. Yeah. Can you explain how that was pre-Pauline? Yeah, yeah. Very good question. Uh, so when we look at Matthew and Luke's gospel, okay, Matthew and Luke definitely have Mark in their possession. They're using Mark as a primary source. Okay, but Matthew and Luke, if you can just imagine this, Matthew and Luke are writing after Mark. Matthew and Luke also have material in common that is missing from Mark. Okay, and it's verbatim, it's word for word the same. Which means Matthew and Luke have another document in front of them that Mark did not have access to. And scholars believe the reason why Mark did not have access to it is because it wasn't around at the time of Mark who was writing around 70. And this document, they call it the Q source document, or the sayings gospel. Historians, they call it the first gospel. And this, and so, so, and it's a hypothetical source document, so they don't have an actual manuscript of it, but you see how they can reconstruct it. In other words, whatever Matthew and Luke have in common, missing from Mark, that's from Q. And it's pre-Pauline even, according to most scholars. It's, it's written before 50 within two decades of Isa de Sarah. So when you isolate the Q source material, just put it on the board, and you read it, none of it disagrees with Islam. This is amazing. They can reconstruct Q. Jesus is a prophet. He's a healer. It talks about John the Baptist. There's teachings about the coming kingdom of God, the coming son of man, the Bar Enash. Isa de Sarah is prophesizing someone's going to come, called the Bar Enash, the son of man, with power on earth. He's going to bring the kingdom of God on earth. Right? Uh, and nothing, there, and let me, let me quote John Dominic Crossan, who is, a, is one of the greatest of the historians of the New Testament. He says, there's nothing, nothing, nothing. This is a direct quote. There's nothing, nothing, nothing about the crucifixion or resurrection in Q source document. Nothing. So whoever wrote this Q source document, they, they, they obviously were Christians, you know, Christians, Nazarenes, Nasara, who believed in Isa alayhi salam. If they believed Isa alayhi salam was crucified, it was of zero importance to them. But what seems more lo logical is that they didn't believe he was crucified. <laughs> yes? Yes, mashallah. So Isa alayhi salam, he, um, he was born around 4 BCE, actually, according to most historians. He was born in the north of Palestine. Uh, in, uh, oh, sorry, he was, he was born in Judea, in Bethlehem. That's the dominant opinion. There's a hadith that mentions this as well. The hadith is a solitary hadith. So Allah alam, but there's a hadith that mentions that on the night of the Isra, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, uh, he was on the Burak and he dismounted at certain locations and one of the places where he dismounted was in Beit al -Ham, or Bethlehem which means the house of bread or house of meat. It seems like maybe that's a place where um, uh, animals were raised or some bread was made, something like that. Allahu uh, So he was born there uh, and then he was raised in the north in Galilee in a city called Nazareth and Palestine at the time was under Roman occupation Okay, so the colony of, of Rome. And you have different groups of Jews in that area. So Josephus, the first century historian, he, he describes these Jews. So in the north, in Galilee, where Isa they said, uh, was raised, uh, it was sort of the, the stronghold of the Zealots. The Zealots were basically uh, three theocratic nationals, nationalists, uh, who uh, basically wanted to cleanse the Holy Land of the pagan Roman occupiers. So depending on your perspective, they're either terrorists or they're freedom fighters, right? But um, <clears throat> they would commit excesses. So they would, they would kill Jews, too, that didn't believe. You know, so they had these sort of Khadiji type uh, tendencies, right? So this is where Isa was, was basically raised in this area. <clears throat> and then you have Pharisees. The Pharisees are sort of the, the ulama of his time. Um, and so the learned doctors and lawyers of the law, and uh, in the Gospels, Isa is constantly butting heads 
with the Pharisees. Um, he, he basically calls them Torah Simun, right? Like Vahiriya. You're just sort of exotericists, right? He says to them, um, he says to them, you overlook the weightier demands of the law, justice, mercy, and good faith, right? He says, you strain at the gnat, but you swallow the camel, right? He says, you're like whited sepulchers. Uh, on the outside, you're washed, but on the inside, you reek of death. In other words, he's calling them hypocrites. He's saying, you don't practice what you preach. He's saying, you're only worried about the vahiri, the vahir. You don't work on the baltan. You don't work on the inside. Right? So the essence of the teaching of Isa, the Islam, that we can draw from this, and this is, you know, Allah, this is what the New Testament says, but we have similar attestation in our sources, uh, is that Isa, the Islam, is essentially teaching them tasqiyatun nafs. This is the essence of his teaching. The essence of the Injil is tasawwuf. That's what it is. It's establishing a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by mastering the self, but following the sharia. Right? And you, even at his time, you do have these pseudo-Sufis, these mutasawwifin, that would reject the sharia, right? And just sort of do these weird things and expect to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Um, but true Sufism, to use a different term, true Sufism, not goofy Sufism, not goofy Sufis, true Sufis, uh, they, are, they are completely indebted, they're completely grounded in the Sharia. And Isa alayhi salam, even according to the Gospels, is a practicing rabbi. Right? Uh, so like Imam al-Junaid, who is Sheikh al-Ta'ifa, he's the Sheikh of the Sufis, he said, "Ilmuna muqayyidun bi kitabillah." Im ilmuna hada muqayyidun bi kitabillah wa sunnah to Rasulihi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Our knowledge, this sacred knowledge that I'm teaching, is grounded and tied to the book and sunnah. This is the true Sufi, right? Um, so Isa alayhi salam's message, the Injil. What is the Injil? Injil means good news, right? That's what it means. Good news. Good news of what? وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْدِي مِنْ بَعْدِ إِسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ And they give you, so, يَا مَنِي إِسْرَيْلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ O children of Israel. And notice Isa A.S. says, children of Israel. He didn't say, يَا قَوْمِ because he's not, that's not his قوم. He is a sahaba, sahabi, in the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ I am the messenger of God sent to you. مُصَدِّقَ لِي مَبَيْنَ يَدَيَ مِنَ التَّوْرَةِ Confirming the Torah. وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْدِي مِنْ بَعْدِ إِسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ And they give you glad tidings, Bushra, gospel, of a messenger to come after me. His name is Ahmad. And Ahmad, according to the ulama, is the name of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the celestial realm. Okay, so in the world he's called, he's also Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the celestial realm as well. But Isa alayhi wa sallam is given this ghaybi knowledge of the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unlike the Yom al-Qiyamah. So this is his teaching, right? In our tradition, Isa alayhi wa sallam, uh, he is he's teaching them the deception of this world, not to be fooled by this world. So he says, the similitude of this world is like a man lost at sea, right? He's lost, like, imagine someone who's lost at sea on a boat, and he says, he starts taking handful after handful of sea water into his mouth. The more he drinks, the thirstier he gets, and then he dies from it. This is the nature of the dunya. He says, the nature of the dunya is like an old haggard prostitute who has to uh, hide in alleyways and she sticks her hand out and it's bejeweled. It's got rings and bracelets and so on and so forth and she waves men into the alleyway. And the men come and then she slaughters them. Such is the dunya. And these are hadith in our, in our tradition. He says to his disciples, he says, uh, so the disciples come to him and say, how is it that you can walk on water? And he said, bring me three objects. And they said, what? He said, gold, stones, and dirt. And they bring these three objects. And he says, put them here. And then he says to the Hawari and the disciples, what do you say about these things? And they said, the gold is better than stones, and stones are better than dirt. He says, they're all the same to me. If you can understand the secret of that, you can walk on water. You can break customary physics. He was walking with his Hawariyun, 
And he was, like the Prophet said, he would actually walk behind the Sahaba. He said, leave my back for the Malaika. Right? So Isa alayhi salam is walking behind the Hawariyu. They're walking sort of in a barren, like, wasteland. And he notices the disciples, they stop and they're looking at something. And they start covering their, their mouth like this, their noses. They say, oh, like this. And they look and it's a decomposing carcass of a dog. Right? And they say, how revolting. And then Isa alayhi salam, he looks at it and he says, ma abiyada asnana. And he walks away. <laughs> How white are its teeth? What does that mean? It means that Isa alayhi salam, he saw the beauty. He managed to find something beautiful, even in this very, very ugly, nasty, <coughs> rotting thing. Like in our tradition, we don't have this idea of him attacking the Pharisees and things like that. Right? Probably something like that inevitably happened because he would engage in debates, no doubt. But in our tradition, we have the Pharisees walking by him, and they start saying something about him. They start saying something about his, his mother, Maryam alayhi salam. And then Isa alayhi salam, he looks at them, and he just says, Wa alaykum as salam, wa alaykum as salam. And the Hawariyu, and they say, why didn't you defend yourself? Uh, and he said, a vessel only overflows its contents. Right? It's like, I don't even, because they were insulting him. You can imagine what they were saying. So it's, it, that's not a civil debate. If want to debate, we'll debate, but they're insulting me. And I don't have that in me. I can't even do that. Right? Um, so this, this is the essence of his teaching. And unfortunately, the essence of his teaching is completely corrupted. For, for the most part, I should say completely. Um, is, there, is there, sorry, I went on too long. Yes, sir. Uh, I attended the Shuma prayer in the big resident in the Bay Area last week and the topic was about uh, Muslims and effects on Christmas on Muslims. Effects of Christmas yes. on Muslims. Yes. And the I felt the entire speech was about isolating Muslims. It was sort of us versus them. And uh, my question, I have two questions in regard to that. One is, Sorry. the entire speech about Muslim identity. And uh, so I want a definition of a Muslim identity living in a Western society. Knowing the fact that the story from the brother here, he talked about that they are, uh, some of our families are uh, yeah. Christians. Yeah, that's a very, that's very, very good question. Very the second good part of the question, sorry, is about, he mentioned that every <coughs> time during our prayer we say and he mentioned the uh, are the Christians and are the Jewish and I wanted to make sure if this is what is meant or not. Um, the, the other way around, the Christians in general. Yeah, so the Qur'an is speaking in terms of generalities, right? So this is a very important point that our ulama mentioned as well. Like the beginning of the Qur'an divides humanity into three broad groups. It's very broad, right? But obviously it's more nuanced than this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving something that's general, speaking in generalities. So the believers, he describes in a couple of ayat, the kuffar, a couple of ayat, because that's easy. Then you have Munafiqun, which takes 13, 14, 15 ayat because it's a different type of animal. Um, but yeah, identity is tricky, right? So we want to be Muslim, but we don't want to uh, we don't want to um, uh, do anything that is that is um, against our Sharia, something that is against our theology, right? People might be tempted. Well, you know, it's just a tree, you know. It's, it's, it's okay. The, the majority of Christians do not celebrate Christmas, by the way. I don't know if people know that or not. The majority of them don't celebrate Christmas. They understand the origins of uh, Christmas as we know it, I should say. Right? Uh, you know, this idea of taking trees and decking the halls and putting presents under the tree. This is, this is all paganism. And this, this is something that is well established. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2, it says, Follow not the way of the heathen who brings the tree into his house and decks it out in gold and silver. Because oh. tree worship, the word tree comes from true, because they believe that trees contain, contain true spirits. 
So putting a gift under the tree, you know, bowing to the tree, here's a gift for you, tree. But so that's not my intention. Yeah, uh, you're, you're not intending to worship the tree. But that's of little consequence because we don't, according to our sharia, we don't imitate the kuffar in their feasts and holidays. Right? It's a very important point. And uh, regardless of your intention, um, because uh, it's a slippery slope. You open up that door, you know, uh, next thing you know, you're marching in a parade of some sort. <laughs> and a lot of Muslims are doing that. Say, hey, what's wrong with this? You know, these are our allies and this and that. You know, so Isa alayhi salam, he's the Christ, he's the Messiah. But the Prophet said that he also told us of the one who is the opposite of Isa alayhi salam. Right? Al Masih al Dajjal, the imposter Messiah. In the imposter Messiah, the very interesting hadith of Prophet said that. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that part of the fitna, and he says the worst fitna, Sharru fitna tenyun the worst of fitna in the history of humanity is the fitna of the Antichrist, the imposter Messiah. And he said that it's so bad that a Muslim who considers himself a firm Muslim out of curiosity will go to the Antichrist, the imposter Messiah, just to see what's happening. And this Anti-Messiah will fill his head up with doubts, with shubuhat, he said, doubtful matters, heretical matters. It's okay, you can do this. You know, you're, that's not your intention. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. You do, you're not, you're not. Come on, it's okay. There's difference of opinion on this. And sometimes there's no opinion. Sometimes there isn't. That's why we have to have recourse to the ulama. The, the deen is vast, right? But there's parameters. These are called hudud, right? Ahad also is the word for definition. The word for the, the word for definition in Arabic is called had. And death define also definis in Latin means towards the end of something. When you define something, you're limiting that something. If I say to you, what's the definition of the Qur'an? It's, it's uh, jins and fasl, right? That's the definition, the logical definition. The mother is a tuna brother, probably. I'm not too big on my logic, but I'm kind of illogical. But. So it's <laughs> jins and fasl. It's genus and differentia. So the logical definition of the Qur'an is a scripture revealed to the Prophet sallallahu Genus is different. The genus is scripture. The diff- what makes it different? Revealed to the Prophet. That's a definite, that's called the had. Right? But when we stretch out, so the deen is vast. There's ikhtilaf, and ikhtilaf is rahmah. But then you have had, you have parameters. What we don't want to do is move the goalposts. Right? That's called radical hermeneutics. Right? And if you go, I mentioned this, if you go to right now, take an intro to Islam class at any public university. Most likely, you're going to be exposed to radical hermeneutics, right? Um, you know, a circus reading of the story of Lut alayhi salam. No, it doesn't mean that. You know, it means something else. It means something else. A, a feminist reading of Surah Maria. What is the lesson? It means that you don't need a man. Who needs men? Be a strong, independent woman. You ever heard this? Strong, independent. Strong, independent. As if men are strong and independent. Who is strong and independent? Who is who is al qawi? Who is a samad? This is shirk. You know, this, this is satanic. You know, you don't need no man. Just you know, just uh, you know, be what, what is it called? Um, Self partner. What is a, there's a new phenomenon going around. It's called sologamy. You ever heard of this? You're going to hear about it. Sologamy means women marrying themselves. This is, this is, this is a, becoming a phenomenon. You're going to hear about it in the next couple years, inshallah, <laughs> maybe earlier. Women marrying themselves. There's a woman in India. She married herself. And all these Western liberals, yay, so brave. You know, these liberals that we consider our allies, some of us consider these are our allies. We can march with them. She's so brave. They interviewed her. Why did you do this? She said, I always wanted to be a bride, but I don't want to be a wife. (laughs) Subhanallah. (laughs) Ajib. No. Yeah. 
You have Muslims, no, no, it's okay. Um, you know, uh, the Quran says, uh, Don't enter the prayer while you're intoxicated, which means you can drink, you just can't pray. Intoxicated. What? What kind of, what are you talking about? No, that's how I understand it. This is what the Dajjal does. Right? He, he puts all of these doubtful things, these shubuhat in your mind, to the point where you're, you sort of retreat away from the religion itself, and it causes apostasy. And the Dajjal tells you that your salvation is in the dunya. Is it really? Is there an afterlife? After, really? No, I don't know. That's what, that's what the Prophet said to them. He said, I'm going to tell you something about the Dajjal. No other Prophet told their ummah. He said, Innahu a'war, wa rabbukum laysa bi a'war. He said, the Dajjal is one-eyed, and your Lord is not one-eyed. And the Ulama mentioned, this is physical, he has one eye, but also symbolical in the sense that if you're one-eyed, right, if I cover up my eye, so, I mean, I'm already sitting here, but if you took me to a place that I'm not familiar with, and I just covered my eye, and I opened my eye, I can't tell how far people are away from me. I have no depth perception, right? That's why if you're a fighter, and one of your eye closes in a fight, the referee has to stop the fight because you can't see the punches coming. You can't judge the distance of punches. You're going to get killed. All right? So, so the teaching of the Dajjal is whatever is right in front of you, that's all there is. That's it. What, what's right in front of the dunya? Akhirah dunya. Who knows? You know, YOLO, hedonism. What's right in front of you? Right? They love the ajila, the immediate gratification, and they put off the akhira. Right? There's a hadith Prophet says, The truly intelligent one is the one who subdues his lower self and works for what comes after death because death is eternal, afterlife is eternal, everlasting. But the unintelligent one is the one who puts his nafs in service of his hawa and has vain hopes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just, oh, I hope I'll go to Jannah, he says, as you know, he's smoking a joint, drinking some vodka, missing his prayers. Like one of my teachers said, non-praying Muslims are low-hanging fruit for the Dajjal. Easy. Easy. Child's play. Right? These are hadith of Prophet We need to implement the prayer. People who aren't praying, we should, we have to implement the prayer. This is, this is absolutely essential. Yes. Um, Based on the title for tonight, these are the four brothers and comments that I've seen. I was like, I was thinking um, about like the prophesies, I mean, receiving revelation, going to find your revelation, I'm not the ghost of the present, and you're kind of expecting this new um, prophet's life, this, this new message to come. So can you kind of describe like what they do with the book that they do? Yeah. It's a very good question, yes. Um, so, in the, in the Gospel of John, which is the last Gospel, and there's a lot of, you know, there's problems with the Gospel of John historically, but the subtext of the Gospel reveals something very interesting that's happening historically. The subtext. So, in, jo in John chapter 1, we're told that Jews send messengers to John the Baptist, Yahya and they ask him, who are you? And then it says, he did not deny, he, he did not, conf uh, he, uh, he said, I am not the Christ. He confessed, I am not the Christ. And then they said, who then are you, Elijah? So according to Jewish belief, the, uh, the second coming of the Messiah will be preceded by the second coming of the prophet uh, Elias, alayhi It was called Eliyahu in, um, in, in Hebrew. And he said, no. And they said, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet, not a prophet? Are you the prophet, right? And he says, no. So it's very interesting that the Jews in the first century, according to the subtext of this gospel, um, were expecting the fulfillment of three prophecies. So the prophet is not the Messiah, 
Okay, and if you have a cross reference in your Bible, the prophet is a reference to a prophet, the prophet of Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, the prophet like Moses. So God told Moses in 18:18 18, 18 Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah, it says, "A prophet I will raise up from among their brethren who shall be like you. A prophet will be like Moses. I'll put my words into his mouth, and he shall say whatever I command him." Right. Um, so, so three distinct lines of prophecy. The Messiah, in the second coming of Elias, and the prophet, right? So for the Jews, they're 0 for 3, right? For them, the Messiah has not come. And by the way, they're Jews right now. I don't know if you're familiar with that, what's happening in so-called Israel, but the top, top rabbis in, um, in the world are saying right now that the Messiah has come. He hasn't come out yet, as it were, but he's in secret talks in council with top, top rabbis. Uh, so, so I don't know if you're familiar with like this is this is very very um, important. This is very uh, consequential. Uh, this doesn't happen <laughs> very often. Uh, but anyway, um, so they're still waiting for the Messiah, and then it, Elijah hasn't come back, and they don't have any candidates for the prophet. Right? Um, the Christians, what they do is they say Isa they them as Messiah. It's true. John the Baptist is Elijah, sort of coming in sort of the spirit and power of Elijah. Oh, okay. But then they say the Messiah is also the prophet. So they conflate the two prophecies. But there's very clearly three distinct lines of prophecy. So when the prophet said him, he received the initial revelation. He went to Khadijah al-Kubra, alayhi and, uh, and her cousin was Warata bin Nofa. And Warata literally means scribe. So he was a... He was a Christian scribe, um, whether he was a Trinitarian or a Unitarian, a Nestorian, something like that, Allahu A'lam. But he was someone who was, according to the hadith, it says, كان يكتبوا الإنجيل بالعبراني والعربية, that he used to write the gospel in, in Aramaic, or Hebrew, and Arabic. So she said, look, you had this experience on, on the mountain of light, right, Jabal al-Nur, and she said, but I'm not a scholar, I, don't, I can't interpret it for you. Right? What had happened to you with, with Iqra and then the squeezing and things like that. Iqra bismi rabbika ladi khalaq, the first five verses. And then when he walked out of the cave, uh, he started hearing things greeting him. Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. So veils have been lifted. So he looked and there's like a tree and there's, there's nothing there. But, but things are greeting him. Right? So uh, she said, I'm not an alim, but let's go to a scholar. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ الذِّكْرِ Right? In كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ The Quran says, ask the people who have specialties, if you don't know. So they went to Waraq ibn Nawfal, who is a scholar of Ahl al-Kitab, and he said, what did he say after he heard the story? قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ أَنَّ akbar كَمَا جَاءَ إِلَى مُوسَى So the great law of God has come unto you just as it came to Moses. In other words, it's very clear here, that, in my opinion, that Waraq ibn Nofar is saying that you are the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Right? In Hebrew, Nabi akim lahim mikarab achayim komocha benatati devarai bethi. Kama, kama, Nabi akim lahim mikarab kamocha, kama. So he, 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 he's actually paraphrasing and actually quoting, sort of quoting some of the, the verse, actually. So in, in his kama ja'a ila musa. It seems like he's paraphrasing and partially quoting Deuteronomy 18.18 18 to the Prophet Sayyidina, that you are the Prophet like unto Moses, that God will put his words into his mouth and he shall speak unto them, every, speak unto them all that God shall command you. The Prophet never speaks from Hawa. Everything he says is Wahi and he never speaks from his Hawa. And he's taught by one mighty and power. So that's one prophecy, 1818 18 Deuteronomy, that's what they were looking at. There's other things as well, the coming of the Son of Man. We mentioned the coming of the Paraclete, mentioned the Gospel of John, a lot of the Urnama. They consider that to be strong. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this will be the last question, inshallah, because we're going we're gonna to eat and we're hungry, and enough of me, inshallah, because I went over. Sorry about that. I tend to over talk. Yeah. Is it okay to say Merry Christmas? You know, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult issue. 
So especially if there are non-Muslim people in your family. So you'd have to ask a mufti, but from my limited understanding, there's some dispensation with people who have non, there's some allowance, I should say, with some people who have non-Muslim family members. Uh, but generally, the ulama say not to. You know, somebody said to me the other day, he said, Merry Christmas. <coughs> and I know, he's, I know this guy, and he's kind of, he wants to sort of, you know, wants to stick it to me a little bit. <laughs> so he said, Merry Christmas. I was, at, I was sitting at Pete's coffee. And strange things happened to, to us in the coffee shops. So I was sitting there, he said, Merry Christmas. And I said, Happy Kwanzaa. And he said, I don't celebrate. I said, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a white guy. <laughs> so he's just, you know, oh. Yeah, so. Allah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. What have we learned? Don't follow women in alleyways. <laughs> Alhamdulillah.